Well, hello and welcome Integrated Math 2. Mr. Robinson with you here in a solution guide video for your group exam. Uh, I'm just going to jump straight into the problems that were all math related. Any of those group ones like favorite color and stuff, obviously I'll skip. And I just want to jump straight into it so you have an opportunity to see what you want to see. If there's a specific problem you want to look at, please go to the description section down below and find the corresponding timestamp to it. Okay, so we actually start with number three here. And number three says match the equation in y equals a times b to the x form that likely corresponds with each exponential graph pictured below. Uh, so in order to make sense of this on your own, for sure, for sure, anyway, regardless of these equations or what, it's not really about the numbers themselves. It sort of is. But for the A value, it's about its sign. Is it positive or negative? And the B value is about, is it more than one or is it less than one? So I could kind of make a table with you here if I have A greater than zero versus A less than zero. And I can also look at if B is um, greater than one versus if B is between zero and one. And I'm going to do this drawing wise and it's going to match up very much with what you see uh, on these bits here. So in this table, very poorly drawn table here, uh, if we're looking at A is greater than zero and B is greater than one, we're looking at positive exponential growth. Positive meaning above the asymptote here and exponential growth meaning it separates from the asymptote as X increases. And here's uh, negative exponential growth as a is less than zero it's going to be growing in the downward direction here like so it's underneath the asymptote and then it continues away from the asymptote as time goes on I'm not drawing the asymptote but it'll be like that dotted line thing they're on the x-axis as long as we're y equals a b to the x form when b is between zero and one we have exponential decay and that means converging toward the asymptote as x increases so a is positive right here a is greater than zero we converge like that and then this one here is a negative decay it does go up but it's getting closer and closer to the asymptote here from underneath said asymptote like that so uh, each of these have one of those features and we just got to kind of find out which one's which um <clears throat> let me uh just look at this equation right here y equals eight times one fourth to the x power this is positive exponential decay so we're looking at this one right here above the asymptote that's y equals eight times one fourth to the x power i can't drag and drop like you can here this is just a screenshot <clears throat> this one's positive exponential growth, y equals 3 times 2 to the x power. Um, so that would be this one right here above the asymptote and grows and takes off. y equals 3 times 2 to the x. And then we have two more remaining. Uh, y equals negative 4 times 1 half to the x power. Negative exponential decay, that goes with this appearance right here. That's what this one takes on. y equals negative 4 times 1 half to the x. And then the last one, negative 5 times 2 to the x, negative exponential growth as it goes down. These are done to scale by these things as well if you kind of look at like that eight is that's y intercept of eight versus here a y intercept of three i guess it kind of makes sense that's three that's eight so that actually is also to scale but um that's neither here nor there these all behave differently so you'd be able to match them up just like that all right there you go okay number four graph y equals two to the x plot out negative one zero one two three and four if you use a table it's possible you can just two, do 2 to the 1st, 2 squared, 2 cubed to the 4th, 0, all that stuff. Not too bad. I will go table-listly on this. Uh, I'm going to rewrite this as y equals 1 times 2 to the x power, just to reference and understanding that a is 1. That's your y-intercept. Your y-intercept is at 0, comma 1. And then your b value here is 2, which means that's your growth factor. Uh, I'm going to double my previous y value input each time I increase x by 1. So I'm going to start at 0, comma 1 as a y-intercept, and every time x increases by 1, I will double my output. I double, it's times 2, and then I take my 2 times 2, and I move over, I get 4, and 4 times 2, I get 8, and 8 times 2, I get 16. Now you guys couldn't, oh, well, let me divide by 2 here next. As I divide by 2 going to the left, 1 divided by 2 is 1 half, or in this case, 0. 0.5. Of course, I wish I could say 1 half, and I wish I could give you the 1 fourth and such. But there's that. Now, when you guys did this on Edge Elastic, you could not draw the curve. I'm going to go ahead and do that for you and just rehash the understanding that this thing takes off in one direction. Oh, no. And approaches toward an asymptote in the other direction. Sorry about that. I guess you didn't have to do this. So, you know what? Why should mine be any better? Um, there we go. Definitely get them arrows. Well, if it's all going to look like a bad drawing, that actually looks better when it. I make it all look bad. And then I'm just going to go and draw the asymptote there, which you didn't have to draw it. There's the connection, it's y equals 2 to the x. Most common, that's the parent function, that's the most basic form right there. And there it is, there are your points. All right, number six, a, uh, this is a modeling, uh, exponential problem modeling equation. A cup of coffee contains 130, 130 milligrams of caffeine, and caffeine is eliminated from the body at a rate of 11% per hour. Now, the word eliminated is a way of saying decreasing, you're removing it. 
So when we use our y equals a times 1 plus or minus r to the t, we're going to use 1 minus r to the t power because we are taking away. This r value is based on the 11%. You shift the decimal to places you get 0 0.11 and the a value is 130 as that is the initial amount after we drink the entire cup of coffee or whoever does so the equation is going to say y equals 130 times 1 minus 0 0.11 to the t <gasps> excuse me power in simplifying that 1 minus 0.11 is 0 0.89 i sure hope you guys were including that um i don't think i'm going to take away from not doing that but it's 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 proper to do it right my my a is if, if this was y equals a b to the x my a is 130 my b is 0 0.89 that's the decay factor it's decaying and my x is a t right there so that's the uh, better look of the equation right there and what it's saying is you start at 130 milligrams and every hour you re you have 89 percent of what you previously had if you lose 11 percent you still have 89 percent of the previous hours amount all right, uh, what is the range of this model? So the domain is t is greater than or equal to zero. And the way of making sense of that is you, let's say you could consume the coffee cup in like a second. You drink the coffee cup, or the not the cup, but you drink the coffee inside the cup fully, and caffeine's in your system, 130 milligrams. Start the clock, time zero. As time goes on, one hour later, two hours later, 10 hours later, 24 hours later, 72 hours later, 2,400 hours later, as time goes on, guys, believe it or not, unless you have some way of having it exit your system, like actually exit, exit, like you're taking it out, there's caffeine in your system, like forever. It might be at point zero 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 one, whatever, but unless you're liquidating it out, you know, through urination or whatever, but um, there's caffeine in your system. Use the smallest traces, maybe undetectable, but it's there. Anyway, so time zero and forever more onward. Now, the thing is, you are losing that caffeine, though. It is getting smaller and closer to zero closer to zero it should never technically truly be zero even if it's the smallest undetectable traces it's going to be between zero and 130 uh, as far as the amount if y represents that amount here and you start at 130 exactly and you can never truly be zero as a, as a reference for that we should understand the asymptote idea of that and that would be your range the range is that guy there okay <clears throat> how much caffeine would remain in the body after 24 hours um I will allow you to round to the nearest milligram in this case because it's decay and it was really close to a milligram. Uh, I forgot to actually pop up my graphing calculator here, so let me get that up. But what I'm going to do is substitute 24 in for T and then kind of punch it all in at once. So I'm going to be, I'll write what I'm going to put in. Let's find out 130 times 0 0.89 to the 24th power here. Okay, graphing calculator, here we go. So 130 times 0.89 I think the answer is around 8 to the 24th power here that is 7.9305 I'll just write y 7.93 milligrams now I said round to the nearest milligram um, so mg so if I asked you to round this time although generally I won't if I give you a growth problem on the actual test I probably won't say round I'll say give me to the nearest person not to the nearest person but you know truncate it or to a, a that cent uh, eight milligrams about, I should probably put the approximate symbol here, about eight milligrams, eight milligrams there of caffeine after 24 hours. So you got rid of most of the caffeine there. And after another 24 hours, it's well, you can figure it out. You can plug it in. Let me figure it out. Uh, after 48 hours total, they're 0.48, about half a milligram after that. But here's the thing. It's still in there, right? So even if you don't feel the effects and stuff, it's not potent. It's still in there. All right. Now we get some of the algebra stuff here. So if 6x squared equals 27 algebraically, simplify all radicals. Now, a lot of people were doing things with decimals in this. Guys, you've seen this forever with me. I'm not, except for the last problem with word problems and context and stuff, I leave things as fractions and improper fractions at that. The one simplification rule that I ask, though, is that we rationalize a denominator. So to solve for x here, we are going to divide both sides by 6. Divide both sides by 6. We get 27 over 6, which, by the way, can reduce. I divide 27 by 3, I get 9. I divide 6 by 3, I get 2. x squared is 9 over 2. If I take the square root of both sides here, you'll get something that says x equals plus or minus. And this is where simplification has to occur because, hang on, my calculator is in the way here. Because I can't have an irrational denominator in any sense of the word. I'm not changing this to 4.5. I'm going to change it to the square root of 9 over the square root of 2. And I can start playing with that. The square root of 9 is 3. So I get plus or minus 3 
over the square root of 2. I can't take the square root of 2. I can't simplify it in and of itself, but I can simplify the fraction. I don't want an irrational denominator. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by exactly that root 2 because the square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is 2. And multiplying by root 2 over root 2 doesn't change the inherent value of the thing. Root 2 over root 2 is 1. So root 2 times root 2 is 2, and that, I got a 3 root 2 there, so it's plus or minus 3 root 2 all divided by 2. That is fully simplified. I think when most people were doing this, they actually got this, so that's cool. But uh, yeah, no square root of 4.5, stuff like that. Even though I said no decimal approximations, when you're putting a decimal inside a square root, that's also no joy to anybody. And anyway, The square root shouldn't have a fraction inside of it. The square root, there should be a fraction of the square root. The square root should have an integer. We're going to take the square root of an integer value, guys, when we do these. All right, there's number seven. Number eight, solve this algebraically. x squared plus 6x plus 14 equals negative 2. Now, this was not only not factual, but I believe it had no real solution. I will solve it with both completing the square, if you chose to do that, and quadratic formula, if you chose to do that. If I solve by completing the square, I'm going to subtract that 14 over to the other side. So x squared plus 6x. And subtract 14 with negative 2, I get negative 16. In order to complete the square, I need to find the number that makes a perfect square trinomial on the left side by taking the 6, dividing it by 2, which is 3, and squaring that value. 3 squared is 9. So add a 9 to one side, add a 9 to the other side. That has completed the square on this side. It made it so I can factor this down to a perfect square trinomial, x plus 3, quantity squared. Remember, it's this number that goes inside here, or 3 times 3 is 9, and 3 plus 3 is 6. That's what we factor to. Negative 16 plus 9 is negative 7. And now that I have this factor down to the square, I can now take the square root of both sides. That is the good thing about completing the square there. <clears throat> so here I have x plus 3 as it cancels out the square. Here I have plus or minus. And the square root of a negative here, I'm going to kind of, you know, I'm going to speak quickly on this. Pull out the negative, have an i. Pull it out. No more negative. i root 7. It's i root 7 now. This is an imaginary number and when I subtract the 3 over it'll be a complex set of solutions negative 3 plus i root 7 and negative 3 i miss uh, minus i root 7 negative 3 plus or minus i root 7 are your two solutions to this quadratic equation uh, there's something that when I plug it in I actually end up getting the left side equal to the right side because that whole i squared becomes negative 1 business all right moving onward number 10 select the expression below not equivalent to 9x squared to the 3 halves power. And yeah, like I don't know how people wanted to best go over this, go about this. Um, when I look at some different versions of what you could do when it comes to this problem, think about these whole rational exponents, x to the m over n equals the nth root of x to the m power. There's one way we could convert this and do the 3 halves power, turn it into the second root of 9x squared, uh, squared quantity cubed. And of course, remember the second root also means square root. You don't need the two there. So you look at this first one, it actually does pan out to be this one. This one does work. Sorry, it, it works as in it's not, it's, it's equivalent. It's equivalent. So let's see, how do I put that? Uh, I'll cross it out in green. <laughs> I don't know what to put. Uh, that's not the answer, even because it is equivalent. Uh, part B, this has nothing to do with radicals anymore, but it does have to do with the whole, I don't want to call it distribution, of course, but you know, the application of the exponent into these guys here, that literally does give you this 9 to the 3 halves power times x squared to the 3 halves power. Um, so b is also equivalent, therefore it's not the correct answer. Now see, I see a 9x cubed, and you know, if we did do this distribution thing of sorts, I mean, the 9 to the 3 halves power, guys, that is the square root of 9 cubed. The square root of 9 is 3, and 3 cubed is 27. Automatically, I'm not seeing where a 9 comes here without having the cubed there as a possibility. I think I gave this, I might have given this too easy of an answer here. I, I don't know, this, it's, it's clearly this. The, the x cubed would have happened, though, because 2 times 3 halves, as the exponents multiply, the 2s cancel out, you would have an x cubed. But the 9, mm, the 9 to the 3 halves is not 9. It actually becomes 27. So uh, it's not 9x cubed. would have been 27x cubed. Um, that, that would have worked. Uh, so this is the correct answer. This one here, 729x to the 6th power. You know, if you take what we have inside here, and we do that same application of, like, cubing the 9 and cubing the x squared there, you do get the square root of uh, 9 cubed to 729. And then you do the x, uh, the 2 times 3, and that gives you x to the 6 there. So um, d doesn't not work, whatever. It's equivalent, so it's not wrong. <laughs> C is the correct answer to this because it's not equivalent. 
All right, uh, number 11, we have some more things. I'm gonna use those properties again with converting to radical form. I think it really is the best approach to using this stuff here, and you can refer to your power table as needed. Uh, let's start with this guy right here. So we subtract, and then this is multiplying by this whole business. Uh, negative one over one and one to the zero power. Guys, that's a one. This all turns into one, not this part, but just this part here. And this times one equals just this thing here. So really, that part's just gone. You can ignore it. It's It's gone. You can just look at 125 to the two-thirds power, or better yet, written as the cube root of 125 squared minus the fourth root of 81 cubed. So the fourth root of 81 cubed. So refer to the power table, do what you got to do. What number cubed gives me 125? That happens to be a 5. So I'm going to square a 5, and the fourth root of 81 is 3. I'm going to cube a 3. 5 squared is 25, 3 cubed is 27, 25 minus 27 is negative 2. So that's what this whole thing evaluates to become when all is said and done. I definitely should have seen some scratch work with this. I think these are pretty relevant things to write, all told. All right, um, getting close to the end, I think a couple more problems here. Simplify negative 4i root 2 quantity squared. I'm going to rewrite that whole thing and, you know, I'm going to separate them with multiplication. People tend to forget, and you don't have to write this to remember, but I'm doing it to remind you. People tend to forget that everything here is multiplying. And whenever you do have a multiplication of the stuff that is uh, raised to a power, you can apply the exponent to all facets of that uh, multiplication. I can square a negative 4 and multiply that by the square of i and multiply that by uh, the square root of 2 quantity squared there. So negative 4 quantity squared is a positive 16. I get a positive 16 there. Uh, i squared is exactly that. It is i squared. We're going to transform that. And the square root of 2 squared, as those are inverses and cancel each other out, you're left with a 2 there. So 16 times i squared times 2. Uh, 16 times 2 is 32, and the i squared becomes a negative 1. Remember, i squared is negative 1 there. And so 32 times negative 1 is negative 32. It becomes a real number in the end. And I think this is lastly, I, I do believe, let's, uh, yep, lastly, simplify this thing, write the final answer in the complex form a plus bi. Basically, have the real number and the imaginary number uh, as written there. So this kind of becomes a foil problem here, just kind of like, you know, uh, kind of treat the i's like x's temporarily, just multiplying things as you do. First, 5 times 1 is 5. Outside, 5 times negative 3i is negative 15i. Inside, 2y times 1 is 2y. And last, 2y times negative 3i is negative 6i squared. Okay. Um, okay. Come on. Okay, are you listening? All right, uh, I was going to drag that part, but that's okay. All right, uh, negative 15i plus 2i is negative 13i. So we have those guys there. I got a 5 here. And negative 6i squared, guys, that's negative 6 times negative 1. So that becomes a plus 6. Right? So I get 5 minus 13i plus 6. 5 plus 6 is 11. So you're left with 11 minus 13i. You know, it's kind of those combining like terms things. The difference is between an i and an x is i is not a variable. It's nothing to solve for or anything like that. And i squared becomes a negative 1. There are other things when i is larger powers. Um, and, uh, you know, when you write in complex standard form here, the real term goes first and then the imaginary. Unlike if this had an actual x, I'd say, hey, guys, standard form would look like this. But, of course, x squared would also be there. So uh, that would obviously be a different set of numbers anyway. All right, so that's the final answer, guys. That is it. I hope that this covered everything for you in under 20 minutes time there. Check the description section down below if you want to receive a problem again. Thank you for watching, and good luck on your test going forward. Make sure you ask me a question in the comments if you do want to know anything more. Thank you. Bye.